All right, so we got a good one here. Um, I finally got around to reading a text I've been wanting to read for a long time this week called Against Flaccus by Philo of Alexandria. And this episode's gonna be all about that. But first, I want you to watch this little clip from a guy named Dale Martin, I think is his name. He's a, he was a Yale lecturer. I think he's retired now or professor. And he gave these New Testament uh, lectures. They're really good. They're on YouTube. You should watch them all. And I can't remember. I think this is from like uh, his sixth episode or something. But listen to what he says now. He's saying more and more negative things about the Jewish law. 323. Before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Now the law becomes a prison guard that keeps humanity, and he seems to be talking about all of humanity, not just Jews. Somehow the law, the Jewish law, in, put all of humanity in prison and kept it there all those years. And what you hear there is kind of a reflection or like a hint at what has been one of my favorite questions for a long time with regard to kind of first century... Rome, Judea, Christianity, and the question that I have is something like, you know, why would the gospel have been so, um, like, interesting and compelling and uh, welcome to the Gentiles? Like, what? who cares, right? For the Gentiles, like, what's in it for them? And I think he gives one interesting hint there um, about what's going on. So with that in mind, let's get to this episode that features the work of Philo, but kind of goes all over the place here a little bit. So, first century. Okay, so Aulus Avilius Flaccus was appointed to be the prefect or governor of Roman Egypt from 33 to 38 AD. And here's what Philo says about him in his treatise against Flaccus. First of all, Flaccus was appointed by Tiberius Caesar and was very smart. Philo makes an interesting point of this. He begins with two or three steady paragraphs of praise. And he says that what, like that he's doing this to make Flaccus's wickedness more conspicuous, right? The point seems to be that like Flaccus was doing what he was doing very consciously and not by accident. So I guess that makes it worse. But then Tiberius died and Caligula took power. And that is when, according to Philo, Flaccus turned from being a good and vigorous governor to being something of a monster. This is, I think, 37 AD, which is, by the way, four years from the death of Jesus, right? So if you're asking me, like, why so interested in this subject? Well, it's like, it ought to be obvious here. I'm like, I'm trying to figure out the world uh, in which Christianity got started. All right, so... Interesting point here, by the way, Flaccus is described as being full of vigor and energy during the first five years of his rule in Alexandria. And then Philo says that during that bad last year, he, quote, began to relax and be indifferent about everything. So I'll move on, but just put that in your head as a note. Philo sees relaxation in governance as the chief sign of Flaccus's badness. Flaccus does speculate about the cause of this, and it's interesting. I'm sorry, uh, Philo speculates about the cause of this, and it's interesting what he says. He, he asks of Flaccus's relaxing in the last year of his governing after the death of Tiberius. He says, quote, <clears throat> he asks whether it was that he was overwhelmed with most heavy grief because of Tiberius, or whether it was because he was disaffected to his successor, because he preferred devoting himself to the party of the real rather than to that of the adopted children, or whether it was because he had been one of those who had joined in the conspiracy against the, the most of Caligula, Caligula. But let's think about that middle hypothesis, the possibility that he relaxed the governing because he preferred devoting himself to the party of the real rather than to that of the adopted children. Hmm. I mean, that seems like an interesting bit of language and an interesting possibility to me. The real children here would be the native Alexandrians. And the adopted children, using Philo's language, would be the Jews, of course. Anyway, it's it was around this time that Caligula started getting very worried. Caligula fell very seriously ill in 37 AD, and some even think that he was poisoned. 
So he came out of the illness very paranoid, I mean, or, you know, just worried, as the case may be. And he had his cousin executed, and according to Suetonius, his grandmother poisoned. Uh, he had his father-in-law and brother-in-law executed. So in the midst of all this, Caligula ordered Flaccus's execution also. But, you know, it, it, like, it took a minute. So Philo says, quote, when, therefore, Flaccus learned that he too was put to, to be put to death, he utterly abandoned all other hope for the future and was no longer able to apply himself to public affairs as he had done, being enervated and wholly broken down in spirit. So I guess, like, just picture Joe Biden here for a minute, right? That's Flaccus in the year 38 AD, or 37, whatever. But then, listen, Philo continues, he says, But when a magistrate begins to despair of his power of exerting authority, it follows inevitably that his subjects must quickly become disobedient, especially those who are naturally, at every trivial or common occurrence, inclined to show insubordination. And among people of such a disposition, the Egyptian nation is preeminent, being constantly in the habit of exciting great seditions from very small sparks. Now, I mean, this is kind of fascinating. You've got the native Egyptians, I think that's what he's referring to here. And then you've got the Greeks, who were like the founding stock of the country. The country was founded in like 330 or something like that, B.C., under Alexander the Great. That's who it's named after. And it was Greek. I mean, it's a Greek city in, you know, the north of Egypt at the mouth, the delta of the, um, the Nile. Now, okay, look, what we're getting at here is that there, <laughs> there was a big riot across Alexandria in the year 38 AD. And it gets really weird at this point. Basically, Philo says, Flaccus got energized again all of the sudden, in 38 AD, and he began to rage. Quote, He altered everything which had existed before, beginning with his nearest friends and his most habitual customs. For he began to suspect and to drive from him those who were well affected to him and who were most sincerely his friends, and he reconciled himself to those who were originally his declared enemies, and he used them as advisors under all circumstances. End quote. So it's like he, he threw out the old cabinet and brought in a whole new one. Basically, those who appeared to have been his enemies before were now his closest allies. Now, Philo says these advisors were only using Flaccus, faking friendship with him. But hey, let's be a little skeptical of Philo here really try to kind of read between the lines. Like, is Philo just another reporter for CNN feeding us the neoliberal narrative? Whereas something much more profound is maybe happening. I mean, hmm, Philo really rails against these advisors. He calls them demagogues, word splitters, sowers of sedition, divisors of evil, and so on. So, I don't know, but we have like a partisan political split here. And it's not necessarily clear to me why we ought to only believe Philo. I mean, maybe Philo had, um, you know, a horse in this race. Now we come to the heart of it. Philo says in chapter 4, paragraph 21, quote, All these men, having devised a most grievous design against the Jews, proceeded to put it in execution, and coming privately to Flaccus, said to him, quote, all your hope from the child of Tiberius Nero has now perished, and that which was your second best prospect, your companion Macro, is gone too, and you have no chance of favor with the emperor. Therefore, we must find another advocate by whom Gaius or Caligula may be made propitious to us, and that advocate is the city of Alexandria, which all the family of Augustus has honored from the very beginning and our present master above all the rest, and it will be a sufficient mediator in our behalf if it can obtain one boon from you, and you cannot confer a greater benefit upon it than by abandoning and denouncing all the Jews. End quote. 
needless to say, Philo of Alexandria was Jewish by birth. He was gr Greek. He was Hellenized, right? And he, so he writes in very excellent high Greek. He was an educator or something like that. And so, you know, this is the Hellenic cosmopolitan Egypt, Greece at the time, right? But at this point, we might begin to wonder more about who these guys were, these new friends, these new advocates, these new, like the new cabinet of Flaccus. Why were they, why did they demand that he abandon and denounce all the Jews all of a sudden? What was going on that, again, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he goes in this very sort of, you know, post-Weimar kind of direction? And I guess all I'll say is I get, just note that it seems to be a very populist sort of a movement that happens all of a sudden in 38 AD in Alexandria. Okay, here comes the next part of the story. Around this time, Caligula, back in Rome, gave Agrippa, Herod Agrippa III, I think, or something like that, the grandson of the famous Hellenized Herod the king. Uh, Caligula gave him his paternal inheritance as sovereign. And as Agrippa was setting out to take possession of his kingdom to go to Rome, Caligula advised him to avoid the voyage from Brundusium to Syria and instead go the shorter voyage to Alexandria. So Agrippa did that. Now, in fact, he showed up unannounced in Alexandria, in Flaccus's like on Flaccus's territory. And as the story goes, he arrived in the middle of the night, Philo says, with so much modesty. Although I've seen papers questioning that part. Um, <clears throat> it does seem a little unbelievable that he just like pulled into town at night very quietly. But anyway, he was uh, just on his way to Rome, trying to get there as quickly as possible, Philo says. Then, quote, But the men of Alexandria, being ready to burst with envy and ill will, for the Egyptian disposition is by nature a most jealous and envious one, and inclined to look on the good fortune of others as adversity to itself, and being at the same time filled with an ancient and what I may in a manner call an innate enmity towards the Jews, were indignant at any one's becoming a king of the Jews, no less than if each individual among them had been deprived of an ancestral kingdom of his own inheritance." End quote. And again, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that is an accurate description of the Egyptians at the time, or the Greek Egyptians, right? The, the, the native Alexandrians. These Egyptian Greek Alexandrians were, by the way, as I say, basically Greek. And as the Wikipedia article notes, if you want to read the page on the pogrom in Alexandria of 38 AD, the, uh, they were like the founding stock of the city. But Philo's take is that the basis of this animosity against the Jews is envy, and that this Greek-Egyptian rabble was just jealous, and that they stirred up this same envy in Flaccus. So, like again, it's like a populist swell here that happens. They basically convinced him that it was insulting that this Jewish guy, Agrippa, should just sweep into town unannounced, basically to check on him. And in short, Flaccus now treats this Agrippa reasonably well to his face, but apparently behind his back, he's insulting him, he's stirring up the population against him. Philo claims that Flaccus should have arrested these people for their songs making fun of Agrippa, but instead Flaccus participated in the abuse. All right, so a lot going on here. And again, that idea of the king of the Jews in 38 AD, you know, so interesting, right? Because the, the, that's the, what the sign over the crucified Jesus four years earlier said. So I'm trying to get all these pieces to begin to fit in a way where this world comes together in a very three-dimensional, very realistic sort of a way. The next thing that happens involves um, a guy that Philo calls, quote, a certain madman named Carabas. This guy, Philo says, spent all his days and nights naked in the roads, minding neither cold nor heat, the sport of idle children and wanton youths. Now, the native Alexandrians take this guy, and they dress him up as a king, and they start hinting that this is Agrippa, haha, ha, look at him, you know. And again, Philo is, like, he, he can't believe it. He's so appalled that they would do this. He's, you know, the disrespect. He's like fanning himself here. He's so disappointed 
in the citizenry, the, uh, the Greek-Egyptian citizenry in Alexandria. But anyway, this mob started crying out at one point, Philo says, quote, as if at a signal given to erect images in the synagogues, end quote. Well, this is too much, right? And Philo has a lot of words to say about this. So listen, quote, And though they knew this, for they are a very shrewd, sorry, for they are very shrewd in their wickedness, they adopted a deep design, putting forth the name of Caesar as a screen to whom it would be impiety to attribute the deeds of the guilty. What then did the governor of the country do? Knowing that the city had two classes of inhabitants, our own nation, that is the Jews, and the people of the country, and that of the whole of Egypt was inhabited in the same manner, and that Jews who inhabited Alexandria and the rest of the country from the Catabathmos on the side of Libya to the boundaries of Ethiopia were not less than a million men. That's a pretty big population, you guys, for the year 38 AD. And that the attempts which, were, this is continuing the quote, and that the attempts which were being made were directed against the whole nation, and that it was a most mischievous thing to distress the ancient hereditary customs of the land. He, disregarding all these considerations, permitted the mob to proceed with the erection of the statues, though he might have given them a vast number of admonitory percepts in, or precepts instead of any such permission, either commanding them as their governor or advising them as their friend. End quote. So, I mean, hey, I kind of get it, by the way, right? I mean, images in the synagogue, that's a clear violation of Jewish law. But then again, just consider for a minute, how did Jewish law become authoritative in Egypt? And what I'm trying to consider here, is in, in like a very neutral manner, neither for nor against, I'm just trying to figure it out, is whether this populist resentment among the native Alexandrians against the Jews makes any kind of sense. I mean, was it merely an uncaused collective freakout, or are there reasons? Look, let me try to get to the point here. From the time of Alexander the Great, who founded the city in 331 BC, Jews had been there. Remember, Alexander was Greek, but he or Macedonian, you know, Greek, but he founded or sorry, but he found the Jews ready to help him against the native Egyptians in his conquest in Alexandria, and so he rewarded them by giving them permission to reside in the city. This is all, I mean, this, this is the situation in this very strange, unique situation of Alexandria. This basically went unchanged through the Roman Egyptian period. The Jews were permitted to be what is called a polituma, which Arya Kasher, contemporary scholar, has defined as, quote, a national or religious group enjoying certain political privileges First and foremost, the maintenance of an independent judicial system and community establishment on the basis of the right to preserve ancestral customs. End quote. We could also just mention here in passing that Dostoevsky's anti-Semitism, as articulated in his writer's diary in 1877, was based on the idea that Jews in Russia formed a state within a state. That's what he called it. He called it a status in statu. Frankly, I don't know enough about 19th century Russian politics to, exactly to comment here, but let's assume that the greatest writer in Russian history, the most incisive observer of human nature, was just completely bonkers and out of his mind on this one idea. That's fine. Nevertheless, the term is probably useful, if not in 19th century Russian context, for describing what was happening in Alexander or in Alexandria under Roman authority in the first century, a state within a state, it seems to be, or a polituma, again, is the term this area Kasher guy uses. But it's very complicated here. Essentially, these polituma were allowed to follow their ancestral customs and their own religious laws, usually as long as they paid some taxes. However, in some cases, there were even tax exemptions. Exemptions from the obligation to military service, and so on. And the Jews were not the only non-Alexandrian natives 
to attain some degree of polituma status in this strangely cosmopolitan city. But the one group that didn't ever get any exemptions or have any special status conferred on them? Guess who? The native Alexandrians. The, you know, Greek Egyptians who had been living there for 300 years. In fact, in one article that I read last week, the claim was made that while the Romans living in Alexandria had sort of top social status because of Roman imperialism, the Jews had sort of second-tier social status just below them. And further down on the social totem pole, in terms of rights and privileges and protections, were the native Alexandrians. Now, again, this is complicated. On the one hand, it seems rather understandable that there might be some re resentment arising among the native Alexandrians if pretty much any outsider has a higher status and more rights than they, the natives, have. But where does the fault for this lie? Consensus is generally that the structure of the Ptolemaic system, which kind of preceded the Roman rule, and which allowed for these ethnic enclaves to try to coexist side by side, was then complicated or like intensified by Roman imperial authority, and the stratification, uh, uh, like in terms of the class-based system, kind of intensified as questions of who gets to live where arose. Anyway, drawing from Josephus now, we get the impression that this same sort of arrangement was struck in other cities throughout the Roman Empire, in Sardis, in Ephesus, and effectively throughout the whole empire. So, okay, I'm doing my very best with some very complicated, often not very well documented, by the way. I mean, we've lost most of the legal documents, most of the like histories that would note all this stuff. And, of course, some very sensitive historical material. But listen to my next claim very carefully. So I'm trying to summarize the whole situation here. The Alexandrian Greeks resented Roman rule. As its capital in Egypt, the Roman government appointed important city officials and controlled the granting of citizenship, the city's constitution, and the minting of coins. The Alexandrians were not allowed a, a, a council. And the Jerusia, the Council of Elders and Magistrates, were probably appointed by the Roman government. So a Roman legion was stationed there. Admittedly, the sovereignty of the Alexandrian polis had been similarly curtailed under the Ptolemies, but at least the Alexandrian Greeks, the native Alexandrians, had a Greek pharaoh ruling them. In contrast, the Jews living there had an ethnarch, their own ethnic ruler. Josephus quotes Strabo saying, quote, there is also an ethnarch allowed them who governs the nation, that is the Jewish polituma of Alexandria, and distributed justice to them and takes care of their contracts and of the laws to them belonging as if he were the ruler of a free republic, a state within a state. To the Greeks, it must have looked like their own sovereignty had been curtailed while the alien Jews had collaborated with their oppressors, the Romans, and been rewarded with greater sovereignty than the native Greeks. You understand? Okay. Now again, if you're looking to place blame, the blame probably falls mostly on the Roman policies here. So in that sense, if we can kind of read between the lines in Philo, the native Egyptians, or Greek Egyptians, reasonably have a solid complaint about the structure of things, but they are probably wrong to aim their resentment at the Jews. This would be something like white Americans being mad about affirmative action policies. Like, okay, at some level it's understandable, right? If every job ad you read says, you know, minorities and women are especially encouraged to apply or something, that, that means not you. But who should you be mad at here? The minorities themselves? Or was it a kind of imperial policy inflicted by the, like, you know, I don't know, the oligarchs or something on the old stock population by, like, an elite class? 
In this explanatory model, the perennial conflict between Alexandrians and the Jews is not best understood by focusing on the victim side of things, which is not to diminish the horrors, okay? I really mean that. I, this was a bad pogrom. They did burn these people alive and so on. Totally disavow. But if we focus instead on the resentment felt by the native Alexandrians and inquire into its causes, then I think this becomes a more fruitful and very relevant research project. Let me try to clarify this again. It is very understandable that Jews who came into conflict with the Greeks, first under Antiochus IV in 167 BC, uh, who were expelled from Rome in 139 BC, and again in 19 BC, and again in 49 BC, and then had those three wars with Rome in 70 AD, and 115 AD, and 132 AD under Hadrian. It's very understandable that they and many secular historians, both Jewish and non-Jewish, should concern themselves with that side of things, with the suffering of Jews. But simultaneously, I think if we investigate the other side of this history, that is, by inquiring into why it kept happening, what caused it, we can approach a different kind of insight here. And okay, Here's my tentative new conclusion. In all of these situations, what you have is natives feeling some degree of envy for the social status and privilege and protections acquired by a people they perceive as not being native. This resentment seems to be the initial cause of the riotous populism that often culminates in anti-Jewish riots, pogroms, etc. But by the way, and not always, but, you know, it wasn't always Jews. I mean, sometimes it was Chaldeans, for example, who were expelled or whatever. Okay, that, like, it, th that is, it's anyone who's perceived as an outsider with foreign customs. You understand? There's a really detailed 2002 article by Sylvie Honigman, published in 2002, as I said, available by way of Google Scholar about how the Polituma worked. And the point I'm trying to make about this is that although I understand the difference between ethnicity and race, in ancient Alexandria, ethnicity seems to have functioned politically under Greek and Roman rule as something very much like the way race works in contemporary America. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that all these people carry these identities around with them. They associate, sorry, they associate in identity groups according to these categories. Yet, nevertheless, they found themselves subjected to a sort of super identitarian rule, that is Rome, you know, America. And as a result, these polituma, these states within a state, they operate as havens from empire to varying degrees. And anyone left outside of one of these semi-sovereign groups was more fully subjected to imperial rule. So in recognizably contemporary terms or equivalents, we might even think of special interest groups based around certain identities, the NAACP, or the League of United Latin American Citizens, or the numerous Jewish special interest groups like APAC and so on. And you have your congressional con uh, caucuses, to boot, right? But who doesn't get to form these kinds of groups? Well, ironically, the original stock natives, right? In America's case, the old WASP class. There's no white Anglo-Saxon Protestant caucus in Congress. A recent article by Leao cites Patrick Sanger on the Polituma question, okay? Quote, the word polituma is frequently used in the Greek language and has a wide spectrum of meanings. It can, for instance, refer to a political act or appear as a term for government, citizenry, or state. As a technical term, polituma can, in the context of a Greek city-state or polis, also refer to the political leading class of citizens as a sovereign body with specific rights. Therefore, in an oligarchic constitution, the word refers to a section of the citizenry. In a democratic one, to the, the entire citizenry. Now listen carefully, still quoting. However, the word as a technical term is not just restricted to the political organization of a classical Greek polis, but can also be applied 
to name a specific and organized group of persons within an urban area. In this context, we are dealing, apart from one exception, namely a polituma of soldiers in Alexandria, with minorities whose ethnic designation is pointing to a migrant background. The members of such a polituma were concentrated in a certain district of a town which was initially foreign to them and where they lived as an ethnic community. End quote. So back to Philo, finally. I definitely understand his rage against Flaccus. Flaccus targeted the Jews and sought to remove all of their exemptions, privileges, and protections. And what had they done to deserve this? Well, kind of nothing. But remember, he was stirred up by the native Alexandrians who had none of these privileges. So after Flaccus ordered the statues of the emperor into the synagogues, listen to Philo describe the scene. He says, quote, Since, therefore, the attempt which was being made to violate the law appeared to him to be prospering while he was destroying the synagogues and not leaving even their name, he proceeded onwards to another exploit, namely the utter destruction of our constitution, that is, the Jewish constitution, that when all those things to which alone our life was anchored were cut away, namely our national customs and our lawful political rights and social privileges, we might be exposed to the very extremity of calamity without having any stay left to which we could cling for safety. What command can be more full of tyranny than this? End quote. And the thing about this is, like, yeah, no imperial rule should be able to do this to any people, right? To, to, you know, making them violate their own sense of righteousness, destroying their own history, everything they were anchored to, barring the normal practice of traditional national customs, exposing them to the very extremity of calamity. It's all bad. I agree with Philo. But consider that the native Alexandrians, like themselves, didn't have protections like these. They were wholly subject to imperial rule. And these were the Greeks, you know, descended from Alexander, the founders of the city who built it themselves. And they were now forced to accept this new Roman worldview that the Jews weren't. And as everyone knows, Roman culture is, of course, just a perverse imitation of true Hellenic culture, right? My argument is that while Philo saves all of his rage for the native Alexandrians, he says almost nothing about the cause of their rage. These Roman policies, continuations of Ptolemaic policies, to be sure, that privileged minorities over and above the local natives. The real culprit should have been not Flaccus, but Caligula. And if not Caligula, then like Julius Caesar who set it up this way, or even Alexander himself who really kind of set them up as citizens in a place where they were not natives. The consequence of attaining that special status was a slow-building resentment among those common native citizens who didn't have even as much. The result was nothing less than a truly violent and awful pogrom, again, disavow. But it's on summing this up that Philo asks one really, really interesting question here. Listen carefully. He says, quote, How then can it be looked upon as anything but most infamous that when the Alexandrian Jews of the lowest rank had always been previously beaten with the rods suited to free men and citizens, if ever they were convicted of having done anything worthy of stripes, yet now the very rulers of the Jewish nation, the council of the elders who derived their very titles from the honor in which they were held and the offices which they filled, should, in this respect, be treated with more indignity than their own servants, like the lowest of the Egyptian rustics, even when found guilty of the very worst of crimes. End quote. Sarcasm here. How dare Flaccus order that the Jews be treated just like the Egyptians? Again, I'm not defending Flaccus necessarily. And the scale and intensity of what happened here is very objectionable. 
But at some level, the spark that started the fire was merely the removing of formerly given special rights and privileges to set things equal. It was the reduction of a certain protected class of people to a status lower than, or maybe just equal to, the natives. One more thought here, tying this all together. It was perhaps to just such displaced native peoples among the nations, lower in status even than their own sorry, even in their own lands than foreigners, to whom the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached. In Alexandria, according to Eusebius, within about 10 years of this pogrom that we've been describing, that Philo describes. It's been, as I said, one of my big questions for a long time. What is the appeal of this gospel? What is good about the good news to these Gentile peoples? Why would they care about the death and resurrection of a Jewish so-called Messiah? And what would it mean to them to be the inheritors of a new covenant that displaced and superseded the old one? Well, maybe it means they get to be the insiders again. Now the law becomes a prison guard that keeps humanity, and he seems to be talking about all of humanity, not just Jews. Somehow the law, the Jewish law, in, put all of humanity in prison and kept it there all those years. Oh, and I mean, you can read the rest of Philo's against Flaccus for yourself, but I encourage you to think about this one last detail. What happened to Flaccus for attempting all of this? Caligula finally took charge. Philo says, quote, After Flaccus had been deprived of all his property, he was condemned to banishment and was exiled from the whole continent. And that is the greatest and most excellent portion of the inhabited world. And from every island that has any character for fertil fertility or richness. End quote. And so the empire regained control. The special status and privileges were conferred again. The Polituma was once again semi-sovereign. And the man who tried to end such preferential treatment, the man who tried to end the special privileges, was no longer fit to live in the empire. He was deposited on some desert island. The last we hear of him is reported by Philo in what is just an amazing, amazing paragraph I'll end with it here in just a second. Uh, before I read it to you, thank you for listening to my show generously and understanding that I'm merely trying to understand everything that happened in this very interesting first century period ancient world stuff. Feel free to leave a comment if you think I got it wrong or sound off or disagree or whatever. Show me where I'm wrong. Anyway, here's the quote from Philo that describes the fate at the end for Flaccus. Then the misery of Flaccus was renewed, as he no longer beheld any sight to which he was accustomed, but only saw sad misery presented to him by the most conspicuous evidence, while he looked around upon what to him was perfect desolation, in the middle of which he was placed, so that it seemed to him that a violent execution in his native land would have been a lighter evil, or rather, by comparison with his present circumstances, a most desirable good, and he gave himself up to such violence of grief that he was in no respect different from a maniac, and leaped about and ran to and fro and clapped his hands and smote his thighs and threw himself upon the ground and kept continually crying out, I am Flaccus, who but a little while ago was the governor of the mighty city of the populous city of Alexandria, the governor of that most fertile of all countries, Egypt. I am he on whom all those myriads of inhabitants turned their eyes, who had countless forces of infantry and cavalry and ships formidable, not merely by their number, but consisting of all the most eminent and illustrious of all my subjects. I am he who was every day accompanied when I went out by countless companies of clients, but now... Was not all this a vision rather than reality? And was I asleep? And was this prosperity which I then beheld a dream? Phantoms marching through empty space, fictions of the soul, which perhaps registered non-existent things as though they had a being. Doubtless, I have been deceived. These things were but a shadow and no real things. 
imitations of reality and not a real truth, which makes falsehood evident. For as after we have awakened, we find none of those things which appeared to us in our dreams, but all such things have fled in a body and disappeared. So too, all that brilliant prosperity which I formerly enjoyed has now been extinguished in the briefest moment of time. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>